Well, good morning, everybody, and happy Saturday. It is I, it is me, it is we. I am sports mental health empowerment coach and licensed couple marriage and family therapist, Dr. Lauren Pitts. This is my amazing coach, Ronnie Ransom Jr. And this is House Talk pregame. Welcome good morning, back, Dr. Pitt. I thought you was ready to start quoting uh, Erica Badu for a second. You know, my eyes, I is we, and we is me. You know, I was, I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> go ahead, spit them bars real quick. <laughs> that's, that's that's how we get down today. Ooh, right. How how, how, how are you doing? Ronnie. You ever had you ever had where we just slap you in the face? Uh, <laughs> slapping is the whole. It's what it's all about. The past seven days, right? Um. <laughs> <laughs> slapped in the clarity, uh, yeah. slapped in the controversy. He just slapped. Um, mm. Yeah, it's it's been a week. Uh, it, it feels like it's been a week on steroids or a really bad LSD trip. <laughs> like mm. it's been that. Yeah, no, nah, really bad. L- mm, yeah, yeah. I, I would agree with that. Yeah, but um, you know, it's April first. The, <laughs> with the first, so. The official, well, yesterday was the official start of the second quarter of the year. So, mm-hmm. you know, I always like to tell people, you know, first quarter of the year is over. You mm-hmm. know, sometimes the first quarter can get real ugly, Dr. Fish. You know, sometimes you can find yourself yeah, down. It was. Yeah, you know, sometimes you can find yourself, you know, just down and out in the first quarter. But, mm-hmm. you know, just like in all games, we got three quarters left of the year. So, mm-hmm. you know, let's start off the second quarter with, um, with a bang. Not a slap, but a bang at least, you know. Um, I'm, I'm really excited. April's here. Spring football is getting ready to come to a close. Sexual NBA, Assault Awareness Month. Yep. Uh, NBA playoffs is getting ready to start. Um, the NFL draft is at the end of the month. Um, Week 16, South Carolina State and oh, UConn. That's going to be yep. a dog fight, right? Oh, yeah. And you, we got UNC Duke tonight. The yeah, first time yeah. ever in the NCAA tournament. And this possibly could be – well, this is Coach K's last season. I mean yeah. – what, I'm a Duke fan, so, you know, I've been talking trash to Tar Heel fans all week. So, you know, what better way for Coach K to go out than beating his arch rival mm-hmm. in the Final Four? Super yeah. excited for that. Today is a great day. Like, ain't no Ooh, clouds wait, in the sky. We forgot something. What did we forget? And I don't remember his name. You, Todd Bowles? So, so Bruce Arians oh, yeah. retiring yeah. and going to the front office for the for – the, for the, what's them people? The Buccaneers. Uh, the ten, and, shout out, and shout out Tom Brady for that. Yep, yep, yep. And and Bowles, right? He's taken over as head coach. Yep, yeah, he, he got promoted as a head coach. Yep. Yep, so he, he got promoted to head coach for the Buccaneers. So, and Brady, of course, came out of retirement. Not that anybody was surprised about that. Um, so it's it, like everything, every it has just been like this massive athletic and celebrity explosion of stuff that is just rich, rich, rich in clinical data. <laughs> you know what's crazy? Like, talking about everything that's happening today, all the sporting events that happen today, mm-hmm. like, that, like, I feel so, I, I feel so hyped now. I feel like I got a game to play today, you know, like, I'm, I'm ready, you know, but, yeah. you know, even, even talking about being hyped up and, you know, e- even having that, you know, that feeling, you know, once again, y'all, we always want to remind y'all that, you know, why y'all are listening to us live on HSRN? Well, y'all listen to us live on Facebook right now, but you can also catch us on HSRN right now at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Mm-hmm. We like to compete against ourselves, but not only do we like to compete against ourselves, you can also catch us on Saturdays at 10 p.m. while we compete against the Quiet Storm and Slow Jams each and every each and every Saturday night. And if you don't get a chance to catch us out on Saturdays, check us on Sundays after you go to church, praise the Lord, all that good stuff at 6 p.m. to start your week off the right way. And remember, HSRN is empowering the HBCU families' head, heart, and hands to deliver the impact we all know it can. So don't forget to catch the other lineup of great shows on our network as well. A lot of great shows, a lot of great gems being dropped. So make sure you catch those as well. Yes, yes, yes. Dr. Pitts, we got a really great topic today. Like, you know, we we, you know we want to kick off um, Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and we're definitely going to highlight that. Um, Sexual Assault Awareness Month. I mean, I'm sorry, Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Um, my bad. Don't slap me. I, pro- I apologize. <laughs> I probably don't slap me. But um, we got a great topic for y'all today. And our topic is talking about mentorship mm-hmm. and creating a partnership for athletic success. And we know that mentoring works. Like anybody who anybody who is successful probably has a great mentor. 
-hmm. know, research conducted across diverse settings and individuals has shown that mentoring works and leads to such positive outcomes, such a higher performance, faster career advancement, positive emotional states, and psychological growth and development. So we're gonna be talking about some of the benefits of having a mentor, whether it's in your athletic career, personal career, mm -hmm. professional career, spiritual, whatever, all aspects of your life, having a mentor that can be well-rounded and, and better your life. We're gonna talk yeah. about the benefits of that. Also, we got a lot of HBCU news to catch y'all up on today. A lot of things moving on in the HBCU world. We got a great mental health tip of the week to talk about this week because it had the whole world in an uproar, literally the whole world was slapped by this news, caught by surprise, mm -hmm. you know? So we're gonna get into that in a few seconds. But um, Dr. Pitts, did you have anything before we get into this mental health tip of the week? Yep, I just wanted to, to reiterate, and then I'm going to do it from now until the end of the month or until the event, um, that on Saturday, April 23rd, uh, the Speak Our Truth organization presents the second annual charity pop-up shop that is supporting survivors of rape, sexual assault, and gender violence. It's being held here in Arlington, Texas from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Central Time at River Legacy Park at 701 Northwest Green Oaks Boulevard in Arlington. Um, it's going to be an extreme hip hop with Natalie go, event going on. Tickets are only $15. You can go to speakourtruth.org and get your tickets. Even if you're not in the DFW Metroplex area, I would still encourage you to, to scoop up three, four, five, 10, 20 tickets and donate them for Sexual Assault Awareness Month, donate them to a domestic violence intervention shelter, donate them to uh, a, a high school or a, a girls or young men's organization because sexual assault happens against, you know, all genders, it's, it's, it's everywhere, it doesn't discriminate. Um, and, and, and let's support this. I'm gonna be speaking at the event, Ronnie, and part of the panel discussions that are gonna be going on that day. So really count it an honor and a privilege to be able to participate in this event and to support um, creating heightened awareness in black and brown communities uh, all over the DFW Metroplex area and really all over the world. So don't wanna miss that and uh, hope you all will, will see the value in, in scooping those $15 tickets and supporting the organization and the effort. It's gonna be a great time. Definitely, definitely. You know, I, <clears throat> I'm uh, kudos to you and the panel for doing that. I think you know it's a conversation that we have to have, and we have to have you know people that can have that conversation in a way where people feel like you know it's relatable and it's being heard, yeah. and we're also you know giving out you know useful information and, and resources. And you know, I already yeah. know, I already know you about to drop some gems there. So you know, I'm, yeah. I'm super yeah. excited for you in this opportunity. Yeah. So you know, shout out to you and all the women and people that are going to be on the panel speaking. Yeah. Um, so looking forward to that at the end of the month. Yeah. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get into our mental health tip of the week. Um, I'm going to set the scene and then I'm going to let Dr. Piss take over, um, because we definitely have, um, some, some, um, some takes on this situation that we're getting ready to talk about, you know, and everybody knows. So this past Sunday, you know, the Oscars was, uh, held and, you know, let's be real. Nobody really watches the Oscars anyways. You know, Oscars is out of all the award shows, probably one of the most boring ones. Um, so. To make a long story short and a short story long, um, so Chris Rock, comedian, legendary comedian, all that good stuff, was on stage getting ready to present an award for, I think, the most outstanding documentary, which um, Questlove actually won that award that he presented for his documentary. Um, so shout out to Questlove for winning that because I, yeah. I haven't seen it, but I heard it was a really powerful documentary. Mm -hmm. um, so in the meantime, so before all that happened, so Chris Rock was up there, you know, and for those who are familiar with the Oscars, most times they bring comedians up there to present awards and, you know, to try and make, you know, the, the celebrities and more relatable to the public, you know, they have these comedians come up there and, you know, they roast them, you know, they you know, take, you know, lighthearted jabs and stuff like that. Maybe, you know, maybe a little low blow here and there to try and, you know, humble them in their, in their own way of doing that. Um, so Chris Rock is up there and Will and Jada Smith, um, you know, are sitting in front row. And so, you know, Chris Rock is, you know, looking through the crowd, you know, pointing out people and stuff like that. He gets to them. So Chris Rock, you know, looks at Jada and says, hey, Jada, you know, what's up? You know, can't wait to see the new G.I. Jane 2 uh, movie. And, you know, laugh like everybody in the building did, you know, a little chuckle. And it was at that moment that, you know, um, Will Smith got up, proceeded to walk towards Chris Rock, 
and slapped him. You know, slapped him, turned around, went back and sat down. And, you know, as Chris Rock is, you know, looking like, you know, well, what, just what the hell just happened? You know, Will Smith yells out, keep my wife's name out your, you know, bleeping mouth. And um, Chris Rock was like, bro, it was just a, a, a G.I. Jane joke. He's like, keep my wife's name out your effing mouth. And, you know, so it was that. And then I think that's when people, you know, in the crowd were like, oh, Will must be serious. Um, you know, so then it went to commercial and whatnot. Um, and then later on, Will ended up winning his award for, you know, best actor in a movie um, for King Richard and everything. And, you know, he gets up there and, you know, he um, half hearted, well, not, I'm not gonna say half heartedly, but halfway addressed the situation and, um, you know, tried to tie it into the significance of his movie. Um, and yeah, so um, Dr. Piz, I definitely want to hear your thoughts on this and, and what you thought um, about that whole situation. So like many people did, I woke up to all of the clamor and chatter about it um, on Monday, because interestingly enough, I had gone to bed at like eight o'clock on that Sunday. Like I was exhausted. So I was in the bed sleep when the slap happened. Um, and my, my first thought was be before I had pulled the video to look at it, I was like, well, was it serious? Like, was it staged? Did it you know, was it something that they had just incorporated in? And, you know, my sister and my husband and different ones were like, no, no, no I don't, I think it was real. <laughs> I was like, okay. So I pulled up the video and I was like, oh, that does look a little real. <laughs> um, and then, you know, go back. Um, I, I tell you, Ronnie, I wasn't, honest to goodness, I wasn't moved one way or the other by the slap or the joke or, or anything like that. Um, I definitely think that the situation could have been handled differently. What I did find myself getting annoyed with was in, in true media fashion, in true, you know, public eye, how people just went into attack mode. Um, and so oftentimes we we see that, right? And, and it's really easy when you're living life in the public eye, you're a target. There's a bullseye on your forehead, your back, your chest, and every place else is fair game. So I want to give my mental health, health tip within the context of the dangers and the damage that judgment and criticism does. And I want to start out, Ronnie, by saying this, and this might seem strange, but as I flesh it out, people will, will get it. You see what that says? What does that say, Ronnie? Neutral. Right. Everything that we encounter, every circumstance, every event that we encounter in life, Ronnie, is neutral. And people can argue me down about it. You know, I already do not care. <laughs> um, it's every event, every circumstance that we encounter in life is neutral. Well, Dr. Pitts, why do you say that? Because it is. And I'm going to prove it. <laughs> Our perception and or our perspective is what determines the meaning that that slap had and that mm -hmm. whole incident, right? Our meaning determines our relationship with the circumstance and our relationship with the circumstance is what governs our experience. And here's how I want to flesh it out for you. Glass half full or glass half empty? It all depends on who's looking at the glass, correct? Mm -hmm. Breakup or blessing in disguise? All depends on how you're viewing the circumstance. Trash or treasure? Obstacle or opportunity? We all get to decide how we view the slap. We all get to decide how we view every situation and circumstance in our lives. From a clinical perspective, when I, because I watched the video several times and listened to it and I said, you know, what, what is coming up for me through my clinical lens? And I, I'm not gonna lie, my, my initial giggle was, well, if in fact it was real and it was not staged, people clearly forgot that Will grew up, was born and raised in West Philly mm -hmm. and that he grew up in a home with DV. 
domestic violence for those who don't know what DV is. And then I thought about how do adverse childhood experiences impact us in adulthood within the context of our ability to regulate our emotions, our tolerance for frustration, our ability to be impulsive or not. And the reality of it is, and many people touched on the fact that when Chris first told, started telling the joke, Will was laughing until <laughs> Ada's expression changed, <clears throat> right? And something about it clicked to suggest that this is not funny to Jada, even though everybody in the room is laughing. And then, of course, it came out that she's been struggling, struggling with alopecia and all of that. And I don't know if anybody knows anybody that has alopecia. I do. Um, I know people that have had alopecia. Alopecia runs in my family. Um, I have friends that have alopecia. One of my childhood friends. Um, has been bald since like eighth, ninth grade and um, how that's impacted her self-esteem and her self-worth and how she was bullied around that and made fun of and belittled and degraded and demeaned because she had this condition that was beyond her control and how in high school she was wearing wigs and how she got clowned and people eroded her sense of self because of their insensitivity. I think in the grand scheme of things, like you said, Ronnie, I think that there are definitely times that comedians knowingly or unknowingly demonstrate a lack of taste in their selection of jokes. I think that, um, as I said in the very beginning, the situation could have been handled differently. Um, the other thing that sort of made me smile or smirk is it reminded me of a situation when I was a kid where we were at the skating rink, Ronnie, and um, someone that I was with hauled off and slapped the person that I was with in the face really hard, showing off. It was just showing off for friends and stuff and hauled off and slapped her. And the initial thought was, oh, they, it's about to be on and popping up in here. But the individual didn't respond in the moment like Will did. The individual was able to maintain their composure, but they were seething. Mm -hmm. And I kid you not, it was four months later when that individual caught that person in a non-public setting and beat the brakes off of that individual, mm. beat the brakes mm. off that individual and said, don't ever put your hands on me again. Mm. Okay. So, sometimes karma works in four hours. Sometimes yeah. it works in four months. So the last couple of tips that I want to touch on, and I want to tie it to the judgment and criticism part. This is what really annoyed me about the whole situation. It wasn't the slap. Right. It wasn't the reaction. It wasn't the distasteful joke. I was more bothered by how judgmental and critical people were of both men, how judgmental and critical they were of Chris for telling a, a distasteful joke, how judgmental and critical they were of Will for slapping him. Because here's the thing, both individuals in the grand scheme of things have had extraordinary careers. Both of those individuals, for the most part, have not been in the public eye with any type of controversial behaviors or embarrassments or shames or humiliation or anything like that. For all intents and purposes, they both have done extraordinary work throughout their career. They, for most intents and purposes, have done an outstanding job of representing Black men and entrepreneurship and they're, the things that they're passionate about in their outreach and the documentaries that Chris has done and the work that Will does in the community and what have you. We're all fallible, Ronnie. We're, we're all imperfect beings. We all have made mistakes. And for all of the people that are out there judging them and criticizing them and questioning their character as men 
and saying how this, this incident somehow is, you know, brings their character into question and their manhood into question, I think is ridiculous. I think that to suggest that that one poor incident that was in poor taste, perhaps on both of their parts, does not erase all of the good that both of them have done on and off screen. I think that it's unfair. I think that it's unreasonable. And I don't think that either of them are any less men because they both acted in a way that truth be told, presented as if it was out of character for who they both really are at their core. I think that um, it's easy for people to say what they would or would not have done in a similar situation. I think that um, people don't take into consideration that we never know the whole story behind someone's behavior, but I truly believe that there is more to a story. When I think about, and, and this is my clinical brain, Ronnie, when I think about the fact that hypothetically, say there was a previous conversation between Jada and Will where something else had transpired that we don't know about. And she said to him, you didn't defend me. You didn't stand up for me. How can I ever feel safe for, with you or whatever? And that came back to his mind when he saw the expression on her face. And that's why he behaved so impulsively. Who knows? We don't know, but there's always a backstory. There's always more to the story. The situation could have been handled differently, but it wasn't. So, okay, it's squashed. It's a week out. What can we learn from it? What can they learn from it? What could be done differently? They both apologize, move on, get past it, leave it alone. And oh, by the way, what would we see about all of the person, all the people that are really, really, really going in on either one of them and on Jada? Because from what I understand, from what you're getting ready to share, there's more that you want me to speak to. I'm good with that too. But what would we see if we shine the spotlight on people's lives who are just ripping all of them to shreds? And that's all I have. Like, it's, it's like, okay, they screwed up. Get, get over it. It, it. Get over it. it they, my guess would be that neither one of them will do it again. Or maybe they will. And whatever, you know, it's, we all got stuff. Like, it, yeah, that's, that's what I have. Like, stop being so quick to judge and criticize people. Go ahead. Ronnie, you, you want to talk about Jada and you want me to comment from a woman? Oh, well, I'm, a, I'm definitely going to answer everything you just said. I definitely got a rebuttal uh -huh. to that. Uh -huh. um, to your point about outside of the careers, yeah, both their careers, I think we can both say, you know, they both uh -huh. had accomplished careers. I don't think nobody's taking that from them. Mm -hmm. However, so I have a couple take, I have a couple viewpoints of this. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, I truthfully do not feel like the event was real. Okay. You feel like not. it was staged. I had a client that thought that too. <laughs> I will say, I, the reason I feel it was staged is because of this. Now, this is my first theory. My first mm -hmm. theory is, is because, like I said earlier, nobody really cares for the Oscars. Mm -hmm. So they needed something. To boost the ratings? They, 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 the needed, boost they needed something that was so like, you know, they love, it, they, they love to grab attention. They needed something that mm -hmm. would grab attention. Mm -hmm. Boom. You got it. My number two theory is, <laughs> oddly enough, Chris Rock just started his tour and Will and Jada both said they're not going to address the situation until her season of Red Table Talk kicks back off. And that's going to be the first episode that they talk about. So mm. once again, so I know I know you don't necessarily pay attention to the hip hop culture like that. But mm -hmm. for those who are, um, you know, who pay attention to the hip hop culture as much as I do, it this has become a common theme among celebrities is mm. that they start a feud or something out of the blue happens between two people. There is this riff or beef or whatever. And then oddly enough, they got projects coming out. Mm. So they needed, they needed something to garner attention for them because they haven't been, you know, like now granted Will was there because he was nominated for a movie, mm -hmm. you know, for whatever. However, now let's get to the actual situation at hand here, because oddly enough, this situation does happen amongst common folk. As, as I live, this situation, as I live, this situation happened amongst celebrities, and people are like, oh, 
oh my gosh, like celebrities do this? I mean, they're people too, first of all. I'm gonna just but, go to the cabaret. <laughs> yeah. So here, here's my thing. I, to your point, I think all parties are wrong here. All of them. If you, I mean, like Could have been all of them. Differently. I mean, I mean that's a no-brainer. From from Will's point, from from the optics of it, I get it. His wife, it was a, it's a sensitive topic to her. She didn't appreciate the joke. He laughs, looks over at her. It ain't funny. Yeah. All right, I got. All right, I got to go up here and defend my wife. So. You know, like now. <laughs> but however, to your point, because you said something, I'm like, I, I cannot agree with it. Okay. To sit there and say that Will has not been dragged through the mud in the last four to five years mm-hmm. would be an understatement. Partly because his wife, his wife has allowed him to be dragged through the mud for the last four to five years mm-hmm. because of the whole entanglement situation. But See, either- I haven't heard nothing about all that stuff, Ronnie. So you oh, got to bring see, me oh, up well, see. Yeah, well, I, well, see, see I'm, I'm real particular about what I put into my, allow into my brain. So all of that, st- I don't follow that stuff. I don't stay abreast of, uh, of that stuff because it's, to me, it's nonsense. And I'm like, I don't, I just don't want that pollution in me. So I don't, I don't even I feel, subscribe to I that feel you on that. But well, so what's well, tell I, me, so well, bring I, me up to speed. What's going on? I bring you up. So to make a long story short, oh God, like I want to say four or five years, between four and six years ago, right? Okay. Um, there was a, a R&B singer, August Alcina. He um, <laughs> had some. He had some medical conditions. He was on like I think he had his kidneys that shut down. He was had he was down really bad, like really really okay. bad. Like had some real mm-hmm. serious medical issues. Like and he just like he his career just started to take off, and then he had the medical issues. Okay. Somehow him and Jada became connected through that. Like she, you know, she became like a, 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 a oddly enough a mentor, a, a, almost like a. a, a a mom in a sense and how she portrayed it <laughs> well um it became more than that you know and they had what she called an entanglement um you know and then so it all came out because you know she put that thing on august and august you know made a whole album about it you know because he wanted like he was like no nah, you don't show me this i want you you sitting there telling me your husband ain't doing x y and z but you doing this to me well, what's up? Like, so entanglement is reframed for extramarital affair. Yep, or a, a tryst. Okay, yeah, that's how she called it. You know, instead of cheating, that's you know, a reframe. It was an, it that's was an entanglement. Reframe. Yeah. Entanglement. Okay, good. So you know, she does this show, Red Table Talk, or whatever, and you know, she had Will on there, and they talked about it, and she basically said, you know, like, yeah, I had this entanglement and whatnot, and you know, you could tell he was just like, I don't look. So. Apparently they have an open marriage and they've had one since day one. That's been now that's been in the public eye for a long time. How, but you, that, but that you know, but, but you mark. But you know what I won't let them off the hook on. Now, granted, they didn't do this. It's not. It's not their fault that this happened. But society, mm-hmm. our our culture, paint when we talk about black power couples, who's a, mm-hmm. who's one of the top three couples that always come up. You got Beyonce, uh, Jay Z. You got mm-hmm. Will and Jada, and um. Hell, uh, hell, just them two. Honestly, that's how it's always been. Like yeah, no. they've made, like, I want that Will and Jada love and stuff like that. So they've been portrayed in our culture as a power couple. Mm-hmm. Now, granted, they might they might not have perpetuated this message, and mm-hmm. it's not their obligation to you know cancel that message either. But that's the message that was out there that y'all were this power couple. So we mm-hmm. see this once again, this powerful black man basically being emasculated. Through a marriage context because y'all are married like y'all mm-hmm. whatever y'all's married however y'all do y'all open marriage at the end of the day legally y'all are married i would okay. assume so mm-hmm. from from in 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 our you in our u.s country like as a man like you know you can't be you know hell if it was will doing if he was had his cake and eating it too we'd be bashing him like see black men always cheat black men can't say wait 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 woman. but i thought you prefaced it by saying that you know, there's this, at least this public assumption that they have an open marriage. So having an open marriage means that there's other stuff going but, on. But right? But still like, but no, yeah, that's true. Yeah, to them, they might have, a, but what I'm saying is like, when it's portrayed as you being a black power couple, like you are a power okay. couple, like when we, you know, when we talk about power couples too. 
So you're saying that the public, that the part of the public discord is that you can't be a power couple and have an open marriage too, that that's somehow going against the public rules. You can't allow your husband to be emasculated on a public audience on a show that you created and allow your husband to be emasculated via something you did and then okay. want to feel pity because somebody made a joke about your hair. Like, that's my viewpoint on it. Like, and that, so, might, and that might sound cold hearted, but like from a marriage standpoint, like granted, we might have open marriage. We might invite people in our bedroom or whatever, but you don't allow me to get emasculated to the public. You don't allow me to- How did that, to so the give me the context of that how what transpired on red table talk that was that the, the public perceived as him being emasculated or so him perceiving that he was a instead, instead of instead of saying instead of saying she cheated she's like oh we had an entanglement she like, so her language and the fact that this dude put a put a, a record out where he put her on blast about what it is what that was she was saying that scenes. will yeah. was or was not doing and yada 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 so in actuality, it's not so much the entanglement label, it's the fact that she broke the rules, according to the public's perspective, yeah. she broke the rules because it would have been one thing, because they have an open marriage, it would have been one thing if she had just did her thing, but you threw your husband under the bus when you were doing your thing, and then it came back to bite you in the behind because the dude that you was kicking it with put everything that you said about your husband out there in the, okay. So yeah, he read, okay. like I would imagine they and I'm pretty sure like I don't you know, I don't know how open marriages work, but I'm pretty sure they probably mm -hmm. like, you know, look, as long as you tell me what's going on, I'm cool with it. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure, you know, whoever the side piece is, hey, look, keep your mouth shut. We're going to mm -hmm. do this thing. You know how, how all side pieces are. Look, hey, I'm going to give you this. I'm going to give you wife, husband benefits. But don't you dare go out here and run your mouth like you my wife or husband. He ran out here like he was the husband. Like, no, nah, I want her. I love her. Like he was in like, you know how they say friends with benefits don't work because somebody gonna catch feelings. He caught feelings. So I think a lot of that, you know, because I mean, basically ever since then, Will has been like, I mean, just we love Will. But as far as from a man standpoint, it's like, I mean, you got your kids writing letters to Tupac. They weren't even born when, when he died. Like, I mean, it's a lot of things that, you know, he's been, I mean, publicly just been, you know, just drag. So I would imagine, and to your point, he look over her and like you said, she might look at him like, see, well, this is why I did that. You know, this is why I can't. And he feel like, hey, look, I, you put a man, <laughs> I'm going to try and say this as PG as possible. Men have risked their lives over what's in between y'all's legs. Mm -hmm. We will, we will go to hell and back mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. Just to prove a point. So I get the optics, you know, once again, could it have been handled in a different situation? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, do I understand the method behind it? Like, yeah, you got to defend your wife. Now, if I was in that position, I don't think I'm, I'm on national TV. I'm not handling that way. But the moment that commercial hit, oh, I got it. I got to talk to you. I, we got to have a conversation. I'm sorry. Like, I'm not just going to let you. Granted, like, I get it. It was a joke. I mean, hell, I mean, once again, I know that there's one thing that black women are sensitive about more than anything, it is their hair. And I, I totally respect it, understand it, I get it. So yeah, was it an insensitive joke? Absolutely, yes, not taking anything away from that, not at all. But I think a lot of stuff there going on in there, it was handled poorly. But I also think, then other thing about the whole, his acceptance speech, and I talked about this with one of my uh, coworkers, they feel like he's still stuck in character. Because mm -hmm. if you go back and listen to, if you go back and listen to his acceptance speech and like really listen to it, he starts to talk like Serena and Venus' dad. Like if you've watched the movie and hear how he talks in the movie, I'm watching it tonight. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet, so don't like tell that. me. He he talks just like that, and then he even tried to compare it, like just how just how Richard had to defend his daughters from you know the public perception and stuff like that. That's what I'm doing. I'm just like, hold on, bro, like. You don't don't sit there and compare what this man did to protect his family from an environment that like, yeah, you might have grown up in an environment, but that's not what you were doing here. You were protecting your kids from a, a, a dangerous world and trying to raise them to be as productive as possible in a jungle. You weren't doing that. You you went up there and slapped the man allegedly because your wife got pissed off at a joke and you had to go defend her honor, even though she's never defended your honor. So, I mean, 
Like, can I give a clinical perspective on all of it? Yes. Yeah. As, as through the couple, marriage, and family therapist lens, you did an outstanding job of of affirming what I said during my tip. There's a there's a whole story. Yeah. And it sounds as if the whole story is extremely convoluted. It sounds as if the whole story exemplifies why, as a couple of marriage and family therapists, all of my work is grounded in family systems theory. Because mm. what's evident is there's a number of systemic issues at play here, and they're, they're interacting and swirling and moving together like fire and gasoline that's creating a bonfire. Like if you, have you seen um, Medea's homecoming? Brown is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> he was up there preparing the grill. That's, that's the visual image that I get as you are describing all of these complex layers of this situation. And what's evident to me is that each of them, it sounds as if could benefit from individual treatment with you <laughs> hey. and couples therapy and families therapy with me. Um, I don't know. Like, see, I was just talking about like, I have a coworker who said that like, that's one of their goals is to like work with, you know, celebrities and whatnot. I was mm -hmm. like, in my mind, that would be cool. But also, like, when I think about celebrities and people mm -hmm. in positions of power and stuff like that, the one way I think of it is, is they are privy to information and knowledge that is far and above my pay grade. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even as clinicians, you know, we're privy to a lot of information that, you know, mm -hmm. we can't share, rightfully mm -hmm. so. Right. I just don't know if I had a celebrity client, depending on how, you know, what, you know, A-list, mm -hmm. B-list, they A-list. I don't know if I want to know everything you know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Well, I it's within like the context of what would be bringing them into therapy. So they might not be in a position to have to disclose stuff that but you wouldn't know, want to know. But like, it's honestly like, I, I, I know people put a, a lot of stock in this. I, I learned at an early age, don't put stock in the celebrities. Like I've never put stock in- They're human beings. Yeah. yeah. But even, but like, it, when you think about what a celebrity is, like think about it, like, we know at the end of the day, just people as a just general, whether you are A-list celebrity or you live in a trailer park, everybody loves attention. Everybody that walks this earth in some way, shape or form. Some people like it more than others. Some people can do it out of in stretches. But at the end of the day, people like to be recognized. They like to be affirmed. They like to be validated and they like attention. Yeah. When I think about celebrities, I just think from a, even just from a clinical standpoint, like, cause when you think of most celebrities kind of have like the same story and MO, like, you know, especially if, you know, if you're a young adult trying to become a celebrity, you grind and grind and grind. And you are literally, you are literally auditioning to be somebody else mm -hmm. to be validated as your own individual self. Like you're never, as a celebrity, you're never validated for who you are. You're validated for what role you can portray in a way that captivates people. As an artist, as a, as a music artist, you're not validated for who you are. You're validated for the story you tell. Whether that story is true or not, you're being validated because of the story you tell. But when you get that validation, when you get that attention, when you get that acclaim, I mean, hell, like I know what it was like just to get individual acclaim at a D2 level football conference. Yeah. I love that. So I can only imagine when you get validated by the world. Like, I mean, I, I think people don't understand like, to be in a position like that, to be a celebrity or be a position that who's in the public eye like that, it sounds good. It looks good because, oh, you got all this money. You got all this attention and stuff. Those people are myth. There is no coincidence. How many times we've seen celebrities off themselves? I mean, just random, not random. I mean, randomly, like Anthony Unexpectedly. Bourdain. Anthony You'll Bourdain turn is on the news and the find out that somebody else committed suicide. Yeah. And, and what you always hear? How could they do that? They got all this. They got all. They got all this attention. They got all the money. How could you dare kill yourself? Like, how ungrateful can you be to be sad? They don't, don't understand. Like, everybody that right there is being. It, it's almost like it's just like R. Kelly. Like R. Kelly had a a monstrous thing done to him as a child, but because of his talent, he was never given the proper care, and he his talent would overshadow his. You know, a lot of his his own, needs. 
yeah, his needs and a lot of his behaviors because of his talent. And, and people exploited him for his talent. Right. You don't think these people are being exploited for a talent just for the simple fact to be validated and recognized? So I think people don't understand like how deep this goes when you get to that level. Like those people, like their their whole livelihood stakes off how people perceive them. <laughs> what do we always say as clinicians? I tell people all the time, if you try to get to the end of the street and every yard has a dog in it and you stop to throw a rock at every dog until they stop barking, you'll never reach the end of the street. Uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> like you, you'll never reach the end. Honey, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> Just stop. I'm can we talk about can we talk about mentoring? I I am I'm not, I don't want to talk I don't want to talk about this that's no more. But mentoring is a valuable character building experience for people from all walks of life. I literally, Ronnie, have been a mentor since undergrad, mm. and um, it you know including athletes. Many coaches and athletes have or have had a mentor that supports and pushes them to perform at the top of their game. And it's, it's so important. I think that it really contributes to heightened and improved levels of performance and um, functioning. I see mentoring this way. Mm -hmm. Mentoring is gleaning the wisdom, guidance, and direction from someone based upon their experience so that you don't have to endure the blood, sweat, and tears to get that experience on your own. Mm -hmm. That's what I see mentoring as. It's, it's someone's ability to say, hey, Dr. Pitts, hey, Ronnie, I know you have done A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, X, Y, and G, and, and your, you know, your levels of success are, are growing by leaps and bounds. You know, I think that I could learn from you. Would you be willing to mentor me? Yeah, because what that says is that, you know what, everything that we did to achieve the knowledge that we have, they don't have to go through that to get the knowledge that we have. Now, are they going to have to go through some stuff? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Everything is not going to be learned through a mentorship relationship, but certainly there's a lot that can be learned without having to endure the blood, sweat, and tears all on your own. So I just... I love mentoring. Like I said, I've been, goodness gracious, I've been mentoring now for well over 30 years. Um, I love it. I absolutely mm -hmm. positively love it because it positions me to alleviate folks' pain. <laughs> it positions mm -hmm. me to be able to say, hey, sup, <laughs> here's, yeah. here's some, some food for you of life and partake and you don't have to even mm -hmm. cook the meal. I've, I've prepared the meal for you already. And, yeah. and you can eat it and, and enjoy it without having to labor in the kitchen. To, to there you go. It. That's a great way to put it. You know, when I, when I think about mentors, what is something that we always say, you know, when, it's, when we talk about children? It takes mm -hmm. a village to raise one, right? That's right. You know, and so, I, so I've been doing mentoring myself. Um, unofficially, I've been doing mentoring since, I want to say, as early as my senior year in high school. Nice. Um, officially, I was doing mentoring work for a couple of years once I graduated from uh, college and everything. We, it was mm -hmm. called uh, therapeutic mentoring mm -hmm. um, because we could, you know, we could do the therapeutic side of it as well. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll definitely talk about the difference between therapy and mentorship as well before yeah. the uh, show closes, either, because there is a distinct difference that a lot yeah. of people sometimes, you know, get confused. Um, but for me personally, I've had a mentor. I've had several mentors, actually. Um, but one of my first mentors, and he's been on the show before, um, my best friend, Carlton Harris. Mm -hmm. um, he's been a mentor of mine since I was, oh God, 15, 16 years old. Mm -hmm. um, we've known each other, you know, almost yeah, 20 years now. We've known each other 20 years now, but he's mm -hmm. been a mentor of mine since about 15, 16. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people like, having a mentor is almost like having a second parent, almost in a sense, mm -hmm. or like having... In my case, it was like having an older sibling that I never had. Yeah. Um, even though I have older siblings, I didn't, I wasn't, you know, raised with them and stuff like that. So I didn't have that in the home. But mm -hmm. having, you know, having him as a mentor, um, it was big for me. Um, mm -hmm. because you know, I think oftentimes a lot of kids, you know, and we talked about this last week, you know, when kids get to become teenagers and stuff like that, 
we kind of just tune our parents out, you know, mm-hmm. and we mm-hmm. go through this. It's a, it's a developmental phase, you know, right. parents don't, parents don't like to go through it, but I think oftentimes parents forget to realize like, you know, when you become a teenager, you really start to think about how you view the world and how you can start to, you know, navigate and prepare yourself mm-hmm. for the world. Mm-hmm. One of the things I always tell, especially in, in, for my boys who are listening, for my young boys who are out there listening, Mm -hmm. And for the parents out there, especially my single parents, you know, because this is a real thing, too. I always tell the single parents, if you have a son who doesn't have a positive male figure in their life by 11, Mm -hmm. you will have hell on your hands. Girls, too. I I, I was going to let you speak on the girl. I I agree. I definitely I think I think, you know, boys and girls by 11, by that middle school age, Mm -hmm. you definitely need another positive whether it's a, a young adult, older adult, but you need that a, a positive young or old adult in your child's mm-hmm. life out, you know, mm-hmm. to, you know, to compliment the parents already. Mm-hmm. Because I think oftentimes parents, you know, parents get caught up in like, oh, you know, I love my kids so much and stuff like that. But they mm-hmm. don't realize like, well, yeah, as much as you love your kid, you also have to get your kid ready for the world. Right. Because these, like, they're going to go through situations that you've gone through as an adult. Now, whether or not you had a mentor yourself, that doesn't mean you deprive your kid of that because you want to sit there and, and prove yourself right that I can teach them everything on, on my own. I can do this by myself. If you think about it like that, I think, Dr. Pierce, I think you would agree with this. It's not necessarily about the kid. It's about you and your ego as the parent. Mm-hmm. Because you're trying, to, you're trying to prove yourself right by using your kid as the experiment. I can prove myself right as a parent. I can valid. I can validate the little kid and the teenager in my heart by being the parent I wasn't to. I didn't get myself. Mm. And you think that's because that's what you wanted, but you're mm-hmm. realizing like your kid is a whole individual. Yeah, our right. kids share the same similarities and characteristics, maybe even the same mannerisms and behaviors, but mm-hmm. they have their own individual mind. Right, right, right. So right. I, I think I think whether I think whether you're in a two parent home, single parent home, grandparents, mm-hmm. foster kid, whatever the case may be. I think by the time you become, you know, middle school, high school age, I think you should look to have a, a, a young adult or an older adult as a mentor in your kid's life because they need that. Or I, and now I don't know how. Maybe unofficially, I think godparents can serve as mentors. Mm-hmm. I think, you know? yeah. I mean, that's one of the reasons why the Big Brother Big Sister program was created, right? It's recognizing mm-hmm. the value of mentorship, particularly in, you know. Um, in situations that kids grow up in where they might not be surrounded by uh, a decent amount of positive role models and and community figures to look up to, they can add value to them. Um, And I agree, I agree, whether you're a, you know, a a lousy parent, a mediocre parent, or a stellar parent, there's still benefits that can come from the mentorship relationship because it also creates space for the child to experience varying perspectives because Mm -hmm. you know part of how we mentor is you know I mentor to a degree through the lens by which I've lived my own life right Mm -hmm. so I'm able to impart wisdom into my mentees because of the lessons that I've learned from good choices and bad choices that might not be representative of the good choices and the bad choices that my mentees' parents or caregivers had. So Mm -hmm. I'm able to add value by bringing additional perspectives into the the mentees' life and and worldview, not um, not to sway them because I'm real big on teaching people how to have high differentiation of self but mm-hmm. to give them data from which they can process through on their own to, to use or discard. It's like, yes. I'm, just because I'm offering the information to you doesn't mean that you have to, like you said, it's, it's not necessarily applicable, but here's a seed, right? Yep. I'm going to plant this seed because it might not be relevant to your life right now, but it might be five years from now. You might reflect mm-hmm. back, well, you know what Dr. Pitt said, you know, Mr. Ronnie said, you know, coach said it, it, it's it's seeds, it's planted seeds and, and that, you know, that can blossom and, and become something very helpful for you down the road. You know, one of my favorite sentences is being like a mentor um, or even just as a therapist, you know, one of my favorite sentences to say, 
Well. Now, when that day come. Oh, man. Look, that's your, that's your, what, what's, it's, isn't it the progressive commercial that talks about when you become your parents? <laughs> when you, when you, that's your, when you're becoming your parent mode. <laughs> and look, I tell them, I'm like, look, you it's might not up. understand. I tell them, I was like, you might not understand this now. And that's okay. I don't expect you to. Keep but living. when that day come, I need you to be ready. That's I said, man, I, look, hang around old people. I tell you, look, you. It's the truth. I, Ronnie, I just said that to a client about volunteering at an assisted living facility or a nursing facility. I said, sit at the feet of them old folks. They are, look, whether it's <laughs> manufactured wisdom or actual wisdom, because some of the stuff they have going on is wisdom just the same. Sit at the feet of the elderly and glean, glean, glean. That's what I missed the most about my grandma. I literally used to sit at her feet. I would go to her house and I would sit on the floor by her chair and just let her pour into me. She just mm -hmm. poured into me, poured into me, poured into me all the time. She, in essence, was one of my mentors because yeah. she she was the one, Ronnie, who said to me, she, she and my aunts, my grandfather's sisters in particular, and, and my grandmother's sister too, but one of the things that they said was, when you girls start thinking about these boys, don't look at everything you like and love about them. Look at what you don't like and decide if you can live with it. Mm. You talk about, I was 12. Ooh. I was 12 the first time they gave me that nugget of wisdom. Boy, and they gave you, they gave you some game. 55, it stayed with me literally my whole life because it's like okay wait a minute what you like and love is the easy part right mm. that's the easy part but it's the stuff that drive you back as crazy that you're like can, do i want to deal with that mess for the look do i want to deal with that for the next seven and a half years while i'm dating you <laughs> do i want to deal with that everybody got a little storm in them mm -hmm. everybody i always every, everybody got a storm in them you just got to decide right. if you want to stand in the rain with them yep and and look and and that's relevant to, to our beginning conversation, right? Yeah. You, you can put every human being, it's so easy to say what we would or would not do, and I'm going to tie it to mentorship, it's so easy to say what we would or would not do in any given situation, but with the appropriate stimulus, everybody can come to the realization that they have an evil twin that lives inside of them that may come out and mm. behave in a way that is uncharacteristic of what people are normally used to seeing in you. When you look at that through the lens of a mentorship, how beautiful is that data, particularly mm. when you're mentoring someone, athletes or hotheads? Remember, was it last week or the week before when you were talking about the kicker and how he slammed yeah. the helmet down and zapped out? mentorship is a great way to learn how to regulate one's emotions on and mm. off the field, on and off the court, on and off the baseball diamond, on and off the ice or whatever. You, mentorship is a great way to teach maturity. Mentorship yeah. is a great way to teach folks how to handle defeat. Mentorship mm. is a great way to help people to understand how to handle what they perceive as failure, because we can speak from, just as you talk about all the time, we can speak from the mistakes that we made, our shortcomings, our pitfalls, why there's always going to be reactions to actions, why there's consequences based upon boundary violations. That's something that you can glean from a mentor. You don't have to make all those mistakes yourself in play. You don't. You, you have somebody here who's got shot knees, scrambled eggs for a brain. <laughs> and they can tell you. And they can been tell there, you. Been there, done that. <laughs> right. They can tell you how some, some better ways to navigate <clears throat> athletic play. Mm -hmm. And because you're a clinician, you can also make the connection for your mentees between mental health and play. Oh yeah. And I, I think, guess you, know, you didn't have that, did you? Well, have, having a mentor in sports? 
did, did well, your mentor in sports talking to you about your mental health? Oh, no, nah, not at all. No, okay. no, nah, not at all. So that's your added, that's your added value. That's your competitive advantage of why you all should be calling Ronnie to be your mentor. Yeah. Well, and well, I think, you know, I, I think from a, from a sports lens, when, when we talk about mentorship and things like that, I think even going back is, you know, I think, and I think, I think athletes will agree with this. I think, you know, part of being an athlete, whether, you know, it's a uh, little league, high school, college, mm -hmm. or even professional, mm -hmm. you know, when you're the oldest on the team, you know, when you're one of the older ones on the team, you automatically kind of, you know, that's, I think that's kind of like a prerequisite to be, to being a, a, a well-rounded eclectic player mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. is, is having that, not that it's forced, but it's just like, you know, being able to give what good is it to hold on to this knowledge and not pass it down? Yeah. You know, and yeah. I think even, you know, I even think, you know, at the high school level, you know, a lot of high schools, you know, yeah, it's important to have, you know, a good coaching staff and things like that. But mm -hmm. if the coaching staff can't resonate with the upperclassmen, the juniors and seniors of the team right. and get them to model the behaviors that the freshmen and sophomores can see, mm -hmm. I can tell you this much, as much as coaches like to think that their influence on, on freshmen and sophomores are impactful, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when, when those freshmen see how the juniors and seniors respond to what the coach just said to them, <sighs> hey, look, if you want, you want to know how to, somebody can take you seriously, mm -hmm. go watch a senior when a coach get to yelling and stuff and see how the senior respond. Mm. If Describe the senior, that, Ronnie, real quick. What, what, what'd that look like? So, our, so, I, so my, my, freshman, my freshman year at State, you know, like when, when I went to college, you know, I, I thought even though Virginia State was a D2 school, you know, mm -hmm. like I had people that, you know, had played there and stuff like that and had played under the coach that was there that recruited me. And, you know, part of it, I think, you know, was probably like, you know, just trying to like, you know, scare the high school kid going to college and stuff like, oh, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, hey, look, bro, you know, this ain't mm -hmm. high school. Like when you get there, like mm -hmm. coaches don't play like they really. Mm -hmm. And so part of that, you know, is and for kids who have been recruited by college coaches, you kind of see that like when, you know, when they come to see you and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. you know obviously you know they're you know they're on their best behaviors they're political and all that stuff tell you how much they mm -hmm. love you how much they want you how much an asset you be to the you know the team and everything and then mm -hmm. that first day of practice it's like the evil twin you talked about you see that <laughs> right. switch like who's that <laughs> and you know so i never forget it like right before my first ever practice at state you know one of the older older linemen he was a fifth year senior that year and uh, I never forget it. He was like, yeah, bro, you know, hey, Coach Arthur, like, hey, look, you know, I know he's cool and everything. But we get on that field. Hey, look, <laughs> hey, Coach Arthur, hey, he loses. He loses, you know, he loses. Oh, his and I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking, like, I come from a high school where our coaches, like, I have I have police officers that coaches in high school. So you already know, they're, oh, they're brain. You talking about scrambled eggs for brain. No offense to police officers out there. I'm not saying y'all have scrambled egg brain. But if you just happen to be a police officer and a football coach, you, that might that might fit the description anyway so you know I was used to coaches yelling and stuff like that but you know one of the things I saw was our O-line coach you know when he would switch that, that's who he was like it wasn't a, a facade or like you know a, a animation in the moment that's who mm -hmm. he was o off the field laid back didn't mm -hmm. yell cool I mean he was from West Virginia coach Arthur man I miss coach Arthur so much my mm -hmm. one of my favorite O-line coaches ever Coach Arthur was a cool dude. I mean, just off the field was a cool, cool white dude. Like, I mean, yo, he used to have some of the funniest jokes ever. Like, I cannot repeat any of them on air, but just know they were hilarious. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, one of the, just a cool white dude. Like, he could come to the cookout. Mm -hmm. Our head coach, though. Our head right. coach, though. That sounds a lot like a microaggression, but go ahead. What you want time now? You going on HD time now? Yeah, I can't. Go ahead, I'm sorry, man. Just sorry. Don't mute me. But um. So anyway, make a long story short. Mm -hmm. You know, our O line coach. You know how he was off the field and on the field. That's who he was at all times. And mm -hmm. so the upper the upper class and the O line they knew who that. That's what they were getting with him. Mm -hmm. However, when I saw how they reacted to the head coach, and when he would get the yelling and stuff, mm -hmm. eye rolling, teeth sucking, like, oh, here you go again. You know, just showing off and whatnot. Cause we got you mm -hmm. know, cause it was. It, we had, I think, 28 freshmen my freshman year that, you know, came wow. onto the team. Okay. A, a good amount for a D2 school, mm -hmm. you know, 28 mm -hmm. new freshmen and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, you look around because, you know, I'm sitting there like, well, how's practice about to go? Like, you know, I heard all these things. 
you look mm-hmm. at the upperclassmen and you know they're walking, you know, really not like into it. You just like what's going on? I just went to y'all just went to the championship last year. Like, mm-hmm. really? And you know, sure enough, like when freshmen see that, when when freshmen see the upperclassmen not carry themselves or respect the coaches and stuff like that and, and show mm-hmm. that leadership ability, they fall in line. It's not uh-huh. because they're trying to be disrespectful to the coach, but we're just like we know. I'm going to listen to somebody who's closer to my age and I'm going to listen to you. Imitate their atmosphere. Exactly. So I think, you know, when we talk about mentorship, I think it, I think just as much as it's important for the, the coaches to be, you know, a great coach, but also a great mentor. Mm-hmm. I think the older players, just like you hear about in the NFL and NBA and all the time, you know, the older veterans and stuff like that, bringing the yeah. rookies and the younger players in and, and teaching mm-hmm. them the ropes and stuff like that. That's mm-hmm. important. You need that perspective. I would imagine when I think of mentorship, just like you said, mentorship is just being able to, you know, impart, you know, wise knowledge onto somebody who might not have, you know, who might be ignorant to the situation. Mm -hmm. And I say ignorant in a a respectful way, because, you know, when you don't know something, you're just ignorant to it. Right. So Mm -hmm. I think even when you think about going to a new country or or a new, you know, a new location, hell, if you're a student athlete and you're going to a new state or we have student athletes who come from overseas over here to the U.S. and and play in sports. So Think about how important it is for those who go out of state or come out of the country to have yeah. a mentor on campus, a, a student athlete that can mentor them and really show them how it yeah. works. Because one of the things that when you're in a new environment or you're going through a new situation, mm-hmm. you want to be able to know that somebody's been through this and you can mm-hmm. get through it comfortably. It mm-hmm. might not be the most comfortable at the time, but you want to know that there is an end to it and it can get through it. Can That's I speak I to that, to... Ronnie, when you finish that thought? Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. You got it. I, well, you said that, and it made me reflect upon my freshman year at Howard University and mm-hmm. how difficult the transition was for me. Coming at that time, Salem, New Jersey was a very culturally diverse area. It wasn't predominantly Black back then. Matter of fact, it, it was more Caucasian back then. And the bulk of my friends growing up were Caucasian and I'm from a culturally diverse family and a, you know, culturally diverse school and a culturally diverse community. And as, as, as much as my grandparents and my parents and my aunts and uncles were elated and adamant that I go to an HBCU, I honestly didn't see the value in attending an HBCU then. And when I got on Howard's campus, I could you not, it was culture shock for me. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the, like, it was extremely, extremely uncomfortable for me. And it was a very difficult adjustment for me because, and I remember thinking, and I don't remember any of my professors when I was there because it was borderline traumatic. I'm not even going to lie. Um, but I remember feeling like I'm, I'm identifying with my feelings. I'm not mm-hmm. judging or criticizing anybody or the experience. I remember feeling that to me, coming from where I was coming from in life, it felt militant to me. Mm. And that's hilarious because people now describe me as militant. But... <laughs> That's hilarious to me. But um, I remember thinking how militant it felt to me. But looking back in retrospect, Ronnie, I could have navigated that environment so much more effectively Mm -hmm. had I had a peer mentor Mm -hmm. or an academic mentor on the Mm -hmm. campus that embraced me and nurtured me through that transition from a a culturally diverse high school and community to the HBCU community because it is a cultural difference. Anybody? Oh oh, yeah, it it is a big difference. Yeah. I remember going to FAMU and when I was when I was working at FAM and during one of my administrative meetings before I even started officially working there. I was in administrative meetings and the executive assistant to President Humphreys at the time said to me, baby, and look at in her Southern draw, she said, baby, have you ever worked at an HBCU before? I said, no, ma'am. She said, it's a different culture down here. Get ready. And I look all green. I did not know what the heck that meant, but trust and believe the first week. 
I would literally, they, they used to laugh at me. I kid y'all not, total transparency. The first three months that I worked at FAM, I started there in August. So I started right before football season started at FAMU as the director of catering. Are you kidding me? Ronnie, I was traumatized. I cried every single solitary day for three months. I was the running joke, but I, I can take it. So I, but they clowned me. They clowned me. Dr. Pitt, I wasn't Dr. Pitt. Miss Pitt, you crying again. <laughs> Yo, it's dead. <laughs> I thought I was a good caterer until I came here. I don't know what I'm doing. <sighs> oh, I was pitiful. I was pitiful because even in a professional context, I didn't have anybody mentoring me at that time to nurture me through that transition. So meant the moral to the story is mentors can serve you athletically, professionally, mm -hmm. personally, in so many different ways that can benefit your personal and professional growth. At almost 55 years of age, Ronnie, I have four mentors. Mm -hmm. I have four mentors and two sponsors. At my age, you, you, you're never too old yeah. for that added support and that wisdom and that guidance and that direction. It is a beneficial relationship. And I encourage every athlete, high school, collegiate and professional, have mentors, plural, have mentors, because there's different things that mm -hmm. one can add to you. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. No, I, I agree with everything you're saying. And I think, you know, to your point about, you know, because even for me, like when I had went to Virginia State, like mm -hmm. I went to a school where it was predominantly, you know, I went through, you know, public school where it was predominantly white. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, unfortunately, you know, our education system portrayed, you know, African-Americans in a certain way and light that, you know, it wasn't until I got in. Yeah. You talking about culture shock. Like, you know, yeah, it was a culture shock. My freshman year, it was a culture shock. I was just like, yo, like. Mm -hmm. It's crazy, but you know, I was actually talking about this with um somebody who graduated um, from state as well, mm -hmm. and I was like, and I see this all. I, I see people say it all the time who go to HBCUs, and I think I think you would maybe uh, agree with this as well. I think HBCUs is the only are the only place in the country where you know you see every personality of Black people. I'd agree the with only, that. And now we'll say this though. I, unfortunately, off off HBCU grounds. The only personalities that are acceptable are athlete, entertainer, um, you know, drug dealer and things like that. Because being a nerd, being an artist, being, uh, you know, music geek, you know, all those other all those other things that you see just on an everyday basis at HBCU. I mean, it, some of the art you see, some of the the the. Um, just the groups they have, the the experiences, the conversations, the networking, the the moment, like the things you have on campus and you it's all black people. Like mm -hmm. you have black people who are, you know, knee deep in anime and, and cartoons mm -hmm. and stuff like that. You have mm -hmm. you have black people who are knee deep into science and technology and, and mm -hmm. things like things that you know you get joked on and clowned on, you know, yeah. off those grounds. Mm -hmm. It is like, you know, praised and accepted there because I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean I, I, this might this might sound biased. I'm pretty sure people who graduate from HBCUs feel this way too. But I just feel like everybody who graduated with me from Virginia State, I can't think of not one. I, I mean, obviously there are a couple people I can think of, but like just from the people I hung around with and know on a daily basis, like everybody who graduated from Virginia State is successful in their career one way, shape, or another. Like, but I also think like having that, you know, we had where um, we had older class, you know, upperclassmen who would mentor you mm -hmm. and stuff like that. I remember coming into my um my freshman year, you got linked with a, a older a, a upperclassman, and you know if you a had any great questions, program. Or like that, yeah, mm -hmm. you had any questions or anything, or you needed help around campus and stuff like mm -hmm. that, you call them, they pull up on you, and I shoot, I definitely use my uh person. I can't, well, I can't even think of her name, but I think she was a junior, and mm -hmm. Lord, she helped me out because man, you know, trying to find classes, you know, within ten minutes, mm -hmm. you know, right. it wasn't easy. But I appreciated her taking that time out and, and giving me the game and stuff like that of how, you know, how it really worked and all that, because mm -hmm. you need the game. You need to know how things work. Why, mm -hmm. why would I want to go make the same mistakes when somebody else made those mistakes already? And I can just mm -hmm. learn from that. Yeah. yeah so I think, right. you know, and 
um, as we get ready to wrap up, I definitely want to, you know, kind of just like to organize, you know, our conversation because we definitely attack this, you know, mentorship from, oh, before we get into uh, some of the tips I have, I definitely want to talk about and, and have you flesh this out too. Um, sure. The difference between, you know, therapy and mentorship. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of times, you know, even or even um, life coaching, because kind of mm -hmm. mentoring is in, in a way, shape or form, life coaching as well. I think people, you know, there's a distinct difference in, you know, mentoring, life coaching and, and therapy. You mm -hmm. know, when we think about mentoring and life coaching, you know, it's. I don't want to sit there and say it's is is basic. Like, I know you're going to say this in a more clinical, polished up way than I am. You always put it on. Why are you always putting it on me? <laughs> because you you are. Why would I make the mistake of saying the wrong thing? when you have done that already and you are wise beyond your years and you know how to say it in the proper way. I'm being, I'm choosing to be wise and allowing my mentor in the podcast game to take on. I know I play with you. Go ahead, man. I think when, when we think about- Y'all don't entertain his foolishness. Do not entertain his foolishness. Somebody Go out ahead. there know it. Somebody out there feel me though. Um, when I think about mentoring and like life coaching, Mm -hmm. I think those are like everyday, like, you know, when we think about like life transitions and stuff like that, you know, like mm -hmm. when I think of mentoring, I think of just like, you know, having like a big brother or a big sister or, you know, just an older person that you can talk to and just ask questions mm -hmm. about life and whatnot, you know, like, mm -hmm. what did you do? Like, what did you do to get here? Like, we, like we talked about last week, if I want to be a millionaire, I can't hang with thousandaires. Mm -hmm. I need a millionaire who can tell me what it was like for them to get to become mm -hmm. a millionaire. Mm -hmm. Same thing, same thing with sports. Mm -hmm. I can't have a, a a coach who only played high school football tell me what it's like at the college level. Right. Like I need somebody who played college football to tell me what it's like at that level and what it takes to get there. Mm -hmm. Because if I listen to this person, what am I going to know? Mm -hmm. So I think when I think about mentoring and stuff in life coaching, I think about situations like that. Like when I think about life coaching, I think about somebody that's just trying to help you. What's your career aspirations? Or like, what, you know, what's your meaning in life and stuff like that. When I think of, you know, therapy, I think, and I think sometimes people, you know, I think, I think therapy now is starting to get an actual credible name and image in public. Because mm -hmm. I think oftentimes when people think about therapy, they still think about going to sit on some old white man's couch and lay down and have your hands crossed the chest, like, you, you know, in a coffin and I talk about your life problems and everything, Stop you know. Playing. I can't let you out nowhere. You ain't allowed out. So, I'm going to restrict so, think, you to Monday through Friday. <laughs> but I think the I think the key difference when we think about you know where therapy takes that turn is that mm -hmm. therapy is a is is grounded in science. Therapy is grounded in in technique in, in actual like research. You know, whereas like I don't want you know uh, a twenty something you know year old life coach like bro, you ain't live life yet. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you can't really, I mean, you could probably tell me about life from your perspective, but you can't tell me about life, life, even mm -hmm. a mentor. Like, I'm just having you mentor me for this one thing right here. I want to be a better football player. I need a football mentor. I want to be a better business person. I need a business mentor. You're helping me in this one specific aspect of life. But mm -hmm. when therapy comes in at therapy, we are attacking your subconscious, not attacking, but we are diving into your subconscious in a way mm -hmm. that we give you tools to help you deal with things that have been conditioned. Ooh. I mean, your, your hardwiring, like mm -hmm. your actual hardwiring. Mm -hmm. I know you're ready to take over. So go on and polish. No, that mind. was a chill. I did. So now people think, what is she shaking for? I literally just caught a to my arms went cold and I had a cold thing run up my back. You, you, but, look, I'm not having a seizure. Like you need a, it sounds like you need a life coach for, you know. Yeah, but see that you crazy person, you, I am a life coach. I know that. Time? That's you know. That's but, why. But, that's why when I said it, I looked. I was like, so, I want to see what she said about her. You know. So let no, me, no shade to life coaches at all. No shade at all. No. You know. I mean, so it, it's a couple of things. So mentoring. When we look at mentoring, we're looking at empowering you to make healthy choices, and within the context of of athletes. We're looking at empowering you to make healthy choices and improve your physical fitness uh, within the context of your athletic play and, and just overall functionality. We're encouraging you to take ownership in your learning and mastery of the game and developing new skills. We're looking at helping you to develop life skills 
um, so that you're setting attainable goals and overcoming challenges and learning how to regulate your emotions. We're helping you to develop your core values and your sense of self. We're teaching you how to strengthen your interpersonal skills and your peer relationships within and beyond your athletic involvement. When you look at a life coach, as a life coach, I also, my primary focus for life coaching is personal and professional development. So when you look at personal and professional development, it's actually an expansion of some of the things that we're covering in mentoring. So as a life coach, I'm, I'm zeroing in on teaching people how to take ownership in their life's trajectory and, and to understand the results that come from what they've learned and how mm. they can shape their learning experience to add greater value to their life. I, I'm teaching people how to understand the importance of mastery of the life skills that we're teaching in mentoring, mentoring and how to apply those life skills to add value to their life journey. In other words, to position yourself, how to experience more and different and better and to do a better job in reaching your full potential. Within the context of mentoring as it relates to core values and a life coach. So as a life coach, I'm teaching you, okay, you have these core values. Now, how are they serving you? How are your core values serving as a platform or a springboard for you, if you will, that is helping you to set goals that are going to be instrumental in helping you to be the best you that you can be? And then from a life coaching perspective, as it relates to your interpersonal skills and your relationships, how are you showing up? When I'm coaching you as, as your life coach, I'm I'm processing and exploring with you how you're showing up and why you're showing up the way you are, which then carries us over into the therapeutic process. The therapeutic process encompasses emotional, relational, behavioral, and mental health. So it's a holistic approach to all of the things that you're getting sort of snippets of if you're being mentored or if I'm serving as your life coach. And to Ronnie's point, from a psychoanalysis perspective, we're fleshing all of that out. And systemically, we're getting to the root, to the essence of how all of these things are impacting your relationship with yourself, your relationship with other people. And because it's a holistic approach, because it's a biopsychosocial approach, we're looking at how the primary domains of your life are impacting how you think, feel, function, and navigate your life. What does that look like within the context of the domain of health and well being? What does that look like within the context of your love and relationships? What does that look like within the context of your career, i.e., vocation? What does that look like within the context of how are you spending your time and with whom are you spending your time? And lastly, what does that look like within the context of your financial status, your socioeconomic status? How are you viewing and managing your money and how is your financial status impacting how you think, feel, function and navigate your life? Because how you think, feel, function and navigate your life is going to determine the quality of your relationship with yourself. It's gonna determine the quality of your relationship with others. It's gonna determine how you're showing up in the ecosystems of your life, the people, places, and things that have the ability to influence how you think, feel, function, and navigate your life. And it's going to influence the quality and the quantity of your relationships. The last thing that I wanna to touch on, Ronnie, that you didn't mention is, well, what sponsorship? Sponsorship are those relationships that go one step further from a mentor that grants you access. When you have a sponsor, you have an advocate of sorts that can speak on your behalf that can say, hey, you know what? Ronnie is an outstanding clinician. Ronnie is an outstanding former scholar athlete. Ronnie is a great person to come in and run his programs and to add value and to mold and shape these athletes to be better men to be better scholar athletes, to be better contributors to a positive and productive society. And that sponsor 
is the person that says, hey, Ronnie, you don't have to knock on the door. I have an appointment set for you where I'm going to take you in and introduce you to the director of athletics at X university. I'm going to take you in and introduce you to the president of X university. I'm going to take you in and introduce you to the coaching staff at X, Y, and Z high school and get your programs into those schools. Mm -hmm. Sponsors give you access that you wouldn't otherwise be able to get on your own. That's the difference between mentoring, life coaching, therapy, and sponsorship. I told y'all. I, I told you. What did I say? I said, I'm going to say it. And then I'm going to let her button it up, put a bow on it, make it look all good and stuff. Because, yeah, I'm not there yet. That's why she's a mentor. Because I, what, what did Steve Harvey say? Don't trip. God ain't through with me yet. <coughs> Y'all don't trip. Not the piss ain't through with me yet. Mm-mm. There it is. But I, 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 I appreciate you breaking that down. Yeah. Um, and as we get ready to close, um, to try and you know wrap this up and mm-hmm. trying to highlight everything we talked about, because we definitely talked about a lot today. Yeah, we did. Um, so if nothing else, if you take nothing else from everything we talked about today, mm-hmm. I want to leave you with these 10 reasons why you should explore, contemplate, think about, do mm-hmm. today, find a mentor. Yeah. Number one, like we talked about, the perspective and the experience. You know, a mentor can give you the benefit of his or her perspective and experiences. He or she can help you assimilate to a new position and give you insider view on how to get things done. Um, number two, thinking outside the box. A mentor can help you look at situations in a new way. He or she can ask hard questions and help you solve problems. One way I like to sell mentors to student athletes and, and the young kids is like your parents will sometimes tell you what you need to hear, always tell you what they want you to hear. Mm. A mentor is going 100% of the time tell you what you need to hear. An effective mentor. Let me, yeah, let yeah. me make, that, make that very clear. An Put that disclaimer mentor out there. Well, 100% of the time, tell you what you need to hear all right that's where that thinking outside the box comes in really really good number three mentor helps you define and reach long-term goals you know one of the things whether you're an athlete professional whatever the case may be you have short-term mid uh mid-term and long-term goals you know one of the things that an effective mentor life coach and things like that can help you with is making sure that you always, I think one of the things that sometimes we forget about when we set long-term goals is that long-term can be a year plus. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to stay motivated on a year plus long goal. Mm -hmm. But if I can take that year plus long goal and break it down to monthly goals, hell, weekly goals, that's what having a mentor can do because a mentor can help you define what that long-term goal is and how to reach that long-term goal Mm -hmm. through Mm -hmm. through intermediate and short-term goals. Number four, and this might be one of the most, this should be top two, because it ain't two, but accountability. And mm. I think that and I think that is huge. Just yeah. as much as they tell you what you need to hear, a great mentor will hold you accountable for your actions. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not that uh, it's not that a mentor is gonna sit there and tell you what you should and shouldn't do, but mm-hmm. depending on what you do, whatever behaviors you manifest and display, they will hold you accountable for those. Because a great mentor will catch you if they see you trying to point fingers and blame other people for how you do things, especially like we just talked about, especially if you come from a traumatic background and you mm-hmm. develop unhealthy, you know, maladaptive coping skills, a That's great right. mentor. Now, obviously, you know, a mentor, a, a, a great mentor will also recommend you to go to therapy for a situation like that. But a really good mentor, especially mm-hmm. a mentor who can relate to your, you know, relate to, you know, some of the things that you're going through, they can mm-hmm. help you how to regulate those in real time until you can get some real professional help. So right. being accountable and, you know, really holding yourself to the standard that they are expecting you to, that's really mm-hmm. important. Number five is a trusted person to discuss ideas and issues with. Once again, you know, for my student athletes out there listening, you know, your high school, college, whatever, obviously, you know, you would like to think your parents and family are great people that you can talk to and, and, you know, give your trusted ideas to. But having a mentor, somebody like, once again, one of the great things about having a mentor is they're giving you an unbiased, unmotivated or uninfluenced, you know, point of view. So sharing your ideas and bouncing off ideas that you might not be too sure about who you want to share with, having a mentor as that buffer, as that neutral, like we talked about, that neutral that neutral person is important. They can be a champion and an ally. You know, you need somebody in your corner. When you feel like you don't have family or friends in your corner, that's where Mm -hmm. that mentor comes in at. 
Um, to uh, Dr. Pitt's point about expanding your contacts and net contacts and networks, having a mentor who has you know is privy to situations, people, events, things like that, having that and building a great rapport. But also a mentor will also show you for yourself how to build that network and expand your contacts as well. Number eight, they open doors for you. They offer opportunities and, and, and places and people and networking opportunities that you might not get if you're trying to do it by yourself. Like they always say, if you want to go far, run by yourself. If you want to mm. go, I mean, so if you want to go all the way, walk with a whole bunch of people. However, I know I slaughtered that quote, but y'all get what I'm saying. <laughs> Number nine, they inspire you. Once again, like we talked about, inspiration and motivation is, is great, but a really good mentor will teach you dis discipline out of that inspiration and motivation. And that's important. And Last but not least, a great mentor will help you how to work better, how to how to time management, how to you know allocate your uh, your energy and your responsibilities to things on a day to day basis to help you with your micromanagement and your macro management. So mm -hmm. those are my ten tips. If you take nothing else from our uh, show about mentoring, mm -hmm. these are ten tips that you can help look you know things to look for in a great mentor. Yeah, and and here's the thing, folks. You all know by now, I am I'm a a research scholar. Um, I love, 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 love research. And mentorship has been proven to be effective in a variety of industries, including sports, right? Um, many athletes themselves at, at some point in time <clears throat> or another, um, particularly when you get to the professional level, they have been mentees and are currently mentees. Um, and guided by mentors throughout their career. There are plenty of examples of well-known and recognizable mentor, mentee, athlete pairs throughout the sports world. And athletes who were mentored themselves are often eager to give back by mentoring someone else, particularly, particularly Ronnie, underprivileged youth. Here's the thing, um, and, and again, tying the mentorship piece to the life coaching piece, Mentoring programs can also be used to help you in your transition to various career opportunities too. So don't discount that. This is not something that's just one more thing for you to do. A mentor-mentee relationship can serve you well for the rest of your life. If mm -hmm. you see the value in it, if you position yourself to really truly um, understand how beneficial the relationship is for you. It's, it's about success, folks. It's about recognizing that, believe it or not, you, we each have untapped power within mm -hmm. ourselves that can be instrumental in helping us to achieve extraordinary feats in our life. Oftentimes, in and of yourself, you don't have the capacity or the awareness to tap into that power that lies within you. Having a mentor can help you with that because they can be instrumental in helping you to tap into parts of it yourself that are, that are unaware. I want you to adopt this phrase within the context of mentoring. Partners in believing. A mentor is a partner in believing for you that believes in you, that does not see those things that are presenting themselves as challenges and obstacles in your life or barriers, they don't see those things the same way you do. They have the ability because of their own life's journey to give you a much clearer perspective or Ronnie, what I like to say in, in the therapeutic relationship, I tell my clients that the condition that your life is currently in we're going to refer to your current life's position as the dance floor. My job clinically is to elevate your perspective to the balcony so that you are able to see your relationship with yourself, your relationship with other people, and your life holistically through a much clearer lens. That's what a mentor can do for you. A mentor can help you to get out of your own way, to see life through a much clearer lens so that you're able to tap into that power that is sitting in your belly. I like to call it, Ronnie, awakening your roar. Mm -hmm. Your mentor. I like that. I like that. Your, your mentor can awaken your roar and help you to be the best you that you can be. I'm encouraging you today. We're encouraging you today. Get a mentor. 
get multiple mentors because as mm -hmm. Ronnie said so beautifully, different mentors can nurture you in different parts of your life within your athletic play, but also outside of your athletic play as well. It's beneficial, it'll serve you for the rest of your life and you will have gems dropped into you that you'll never forget. And that's what we're gonna leave you with today. We want you to watch some basketball, have an amazing, amazing remainder of your weekend. Be kind to one another. Don't slap anybody. Don't be judgmental or critical and just enjoy life and actually position yourself to live life in a way that you can honestly say, I love my life. Happy Saturday, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.